tonight's feature demonstrator is Pat Scott. He's from, uh, well, where do you live now? Lakewood. Lakewood, Colorado. He's, uh, like I mentioned earlier, he was a front range, uh, front range wood turner's president for three years um, and just kind of got out of that position, I think, last year or a year before. Last year, a couple years ago, yeah. Um, so he's enjoying turning again and getting some time to do that, which is awesome. And let's welcome Pat. Pat. You want to tell us about yourself and go ahead and start your demo then. Okay, can you hear me? Is that good? Am I on camera? How's my hair? Is it good? <laughs> well, there isn't much to tell about me. Um, yeah, I've, I've uh, been a member of the Denver Club for a long time. I've been a co-member of this club also for five years. And uh, like Bob was saying, twenty-two fifty. you know, to half price, you can't beat that. It's a good deal. And I don't get up here every month, uh, but I do watch you guys on Zoom, so that's nice to have that capability as well. Uh, I, I'm going to jump right into it because I really need all the time I can get because I talk too much. Um, so my demo tonight, uh, huh? What? You, I did this demo uh, when, Larry, a couple years ago down in Colorado Springs, and I think they kicked me out at three hours after my demo, so... <laughs> I've been practicing to get it down into about an hour and a half, so we'll see what I do. Uh, so I call this demo the, the perfect pepper mill, and by that, what I mean is, is I just try and make it, this pepper mill as perfect as I can in, in every aspect. Uh, I want the holes that I drill, I want them to be uh, perfectly round, perfect size, perfectly centered. I want the fit between the top and the bottom to be perfect, the gap between top and bottom to be perfect, top turn nice and freely like it's supposed to, the curves, the uh, proportions, everything. I just want that to be as, as perfect as I can. Uh, in 2011, I took a class at Craft Supply with uh, Paul Chilton on making pepper mills. Have, have any of you guys heard of Paul before? Nobody heard of Paul Chilton? You heard of Paul Chilton? Yeah, he's a great guy. Um, in the Craft Supply catalog, under the uh, artisan mechanisms, sorry, Where's the, where's the camera at? These are Paul's mills right here. And I had admired, yeah, these are his right here. I had admired his mills for a long time uh, before I took the class. And so when I found out that he was going to teach a class, I jumped on it. It was a, a two-day weekend workshop, and we made two pepper mills the whole weekend. And it doesn't take a whole day to make a pepper mill, but, you know, you can imagine in a classroom environment, things go slower, but also there was just so much discussion on technique and, and style and shape and, and finishing and sanding and everything. So the way that I make uh, pepper mills today is pretty much the way I made them back then. I've changed a few things that suit me better in the way that I turn, but, uh, but otherwise, you know, this is how I do it. Um, and uh, you can go out onto YouTube and out on the internet, and there's all different kinds of ways to make pepper mills. Um, you know, some guys will, they'll completely turn the outside and sand it and finish before they ever cut it in half and drill holes. That's one way. I wouldn't recommend that way. The way I do it is I drill the holes first, um, and then I'll finish and sand it later. But uh, like I said, there's all different ways to do it, and I'm just going to show you how I do it. Over the years, uh, I have obtained a few uh, different jaws that help me make pepper mills. So just because I'm using something, don't think that, oh, I got to, unless you need an excuse to get a new tool, um, you know, there's all different kinds of ways to, to hold the workpiece and, and drill holes and all that kind of stuff. But we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. But uh, any, any questions? I know there's a couple of people that... Uh, haven't made pepper mills yet and are looking forward to it, but if you guys have made pepper mills before, if you struggle with a certain step or something like that, let me know. I'll, sh I'll show you how I do it, and uh, believe me, I've made plenty, and I've had to figure out how to hold the piece afterwards or how to redo something and, and so on. Uh-huh. Yes. The biggest thing I struggle with is finding a good kit to fill it with. Oh, okay. So, uh, suggestions appreciated. The, you bet, you bet. The, well, the kit that I use is the deluxe kit that Craft Supply sells. You're talking about the mechanism itself? Um, Craft Supply and Packard, they call it their deluxe kit. It's made by Chef Specialties. Uh, 
Craft Supply also sells an artisan kit, which I've used before, but I like the chef specialties better, or the deluxe kit. Um, there's also the um, crush grind. Um, I have one of those kits. I've never made one of those. I just have never got around to it because this, this kit does everything that I need it to. Um, but we can talk about crush grind later. I'll tell you what little bit I know about it. But, yeah, you can't go wrong with that. And, you know, the price of those are all the same. Doesn't doesn't matter if it's the artisan, deluxe, chef specialty, chef wear kits, uh, crush grind. They're all 10 to $15, you know, for uh, 8 to 10-inch mill, something like that. So, all right, there's uh, in my book, there's a couple of things you need to have uh, before you start making a pepper mill. And, obviously, mechanism is one. The uh, second thing you need is a dry piece of wood. And I can't emphasize dry enough. It has to be dry. You know, it could be dry on the outside surface, but where we want it to be dry is in the very center, but not, not here on the end in the center. We want it in the center of the center of center, right? And if you go by that rule of thumb that everybody says for every inch of thickness, allow a year to air dry, well, you can imagine a three by three blank. Now we're talking three years to air dry. And some people say an inch per, a year per inch plus a year. Now we're talking four years. If you buy a blank out on the, on the Woodcraft store or online or something like that, and it's, and it's got a wax coating on it, if you leave the wax on, double that amount of time. It'll never dry. Vince. <laughs> Do you always have to start with a three? You, yeah, do you always have the question for those on Zoom, uh, do you always have to start with a 3x3 three three blank or can you start with something smaller? Absolutely, start with something smaller. It all comes down to what design you want to make. Um, I, <clears throat> I start with a 3x3, three three, but my finished size is, for at least the mill I'm going to make tonight, it's going to be 2 and 5 eighths. So it gives me plenty of uh, room. And the smaller mill that I make, of course I can, you know, a small... You make a little small uh, four-inch mill, and you don't need to have a big three-inch blank. You know, you can start with little scrap cutoffs and stuff like that. So, the outside has to be bigger than the inside. Than the inside. <laughs> yeah, uh, and a lot of blanks that you buy in the store, they are typically three by three by twelve inches. Um, this, I'm going to make an eight-inch mill tonight. This is an eight and a half-inch long piece of wood. So you don't need to have, you know, two inches extra to make a pepper mill. If the, if the ends of the blank are what I call clean or clear, meaning that there's no cracks, splits, checks, nothing like that, if they're nice and clean, all you need to allow extra is really only a half an inch. And so eight and a half inch blank, I can make an eight inch mill. Uh, I saw one guy online, he was saying you needed to have two and a half inches extra to make the mill, and I'm thinking, well, that's at least you know a couple inches extra of waste that you don't need. But uh, anyway, so it's got to be dry on the inside. Um, so that's that's one of the requirements. The other requirement is you have to have a design. So leading into uh, Vince's question, can you use a smaller piece? You bet, if your design allows for that, and and have something in mind. But better yet, draw it out and draw it out full scale and get it on paper and and get it to where you like you can erase curves and increase thicknesses and widths and all that kind of stuff and then if you like it on paper chances are you're going to like it in real life as well the other advantage of having it on paper is now i can take my measurements directly off of this and i can say oh the wide part of the base is so far up from the bottom and and my head is this big a diameter etc cetera, etc cetera. so please don't just throw a piece of wood on there and say, I'm going to let the wood talk to me, and I'll let the wood tell me what it wants to be. It, if you do that, it's probably going to look like you did that. And I want you to send me a picture of your mill so that I can print it out and put it in my binder of ugly pepper mills. <clears throat> and I actually have a binder like that, and I forgot to bring it. But it's got some, Larry, did you look at it the last time? It's got some ugly ones in there, doesn't it? Yeah, and I mean, the proportions are wrong and the curves and nothing looks right. It just doesn't flow from top to bottom. So have a design, draw it out, and, uh, and then I think you're going to have better luck. All right, 
So I, got a, I have a dry piece of wood. This is actually a piece of a 100-year-old silver maple that was cut down six years ago. Um, I need to put a, a center mark on it. Uh, and there's, you know, a couple different ways to do that. Uh, a lot of guys will just put a ruler from corner to corner. Uh, but you can see that I've, I've cut the corners off, haven't I? That'll reduce your drying time 20 to 25 percent. So instead of the air having to go from the corner all the way to center, now it only has to go from here to center. So there's, there's your little tip there. Save those off cuts or those corners that you cut off because now you can use those as spacers if you're stacking up blanks to dry. So I don't have corners anymore, but I need to mark the center. And so what other, another way guys will do it is they'll use a center finder, right? And these work pretty good. And you just set it down and mark the corner. I usually go all the way around. And these work pretty good, except if your blank doesn't dry square. And, and it can have, sometimes it can have a little bit of wiggle room in it, right? And so now you're not sure which edge is my reference edge. You know, do I draw my line there? Do I draw my line here? Maybe you draw both. So something else you can do is I just have a, uh, a scrap piece of eighth inch thick cardboard that I just made a three inch disc out of with the hole in the center. I don't know if you guys can see that, right? And this, I just set it down on the end of the blank and I use my fingers to center it. And if there's any overhang, you'd be surprised how accurate your fingers are trying to uh, feel the overhang. And it's just real easy to just center it and then you can punch your, punch your center mark. And I usually, when I make pepper mills, I don't necessarily just make one at a time. And with, with this, I can just go down the line, just bing, 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 and uh, punch my center marks. There's your first tip of the day. That's your second tip. Your first tip was cut the corners off. Um, so has anybody in here made a pepper mill yet? And you've kind of struggled with all of the steps that are involved in making it. I mean, there's a lot of holes to drill, and they're weird sizes and what if you did step one two four three instead of one two three four anybody have that problem or have have all those steps kind of uh, prevented you from making a pepper mill maybe you've dragged your feet because you didn't know about all those steps anybody in here like that nobody yes I heard one two so let me try and put your mind at ease there's, and people are surprised when I say this, and it was in the write-up, there are only four steps to making a pepper mill, just four basic steps. And step one is, is you get a blank of the appropriate size. You're, we're going to mount it between centers, turn it round, put a tenon on each end, and then we're going to cut it in half. That's step one. Step two, we're going to drill all the holes. Step three, we're going to shape the outside profile. And then step four, we'll sand and finish. So what's the big deal, right? There isn't. Now, granted, though, there, there might be a, you know, a step 1, 1A, one 1B, one 1C, one 2A, 2B, 2C, 2D, 2E, but just think of those four steps and you guys will be just fine. Think of it that way. That's my joke for the day. And those of uh, you from the Denver Club, you're going to hear that same joke in September. So I'm giving the same demo to the Denver Club in September. All right, I'm going to mount it between centers. <clears throat> I've got, uh, I have a step center. Uh, it's a knockoff, but I have a step center in the headstock, revolving center in the tailstock. If your tailstock has that cone on it, take it off. Get rid of it. We don't need it right now. All it will do is just keep driving deeper and deeper into the wood. So we don't need that. Uh, you could use your four-prong center if you'd like. That's fine. And I'm just going to use a spindle roughing gouge. So step one, mount a piece of wood, turn it round, put a tenon on each end. And uh, your speed is whatever you're comfortable with. Make sure, oops. We'll see how that goes. My tool rest is uh, just a little bit above center. I don't think it's quite high enough above center. It'll work. So some guys on uh, YouTube, I see them trying to make this perfectly round at this point, and they're out there with calipers and all that kind of stuff. Good enough. It doesn't have to be perfectly round at this point because I still have to shape the outside profile. 
So we'll put a tenon on each end. There's different tools you can use for that. This is a, here, uh, did I do that right? This is a 3 8 inch beading parting tool. You could use a skew, spindle gouge. Did I hold that there long enough? Okay. Uh, yeah, all kinds of tools. Scraper. So we're just going to do a quick little tenon on each end. And I want to make, make sure this inside, ch if I turn this on, oh man, that, so that thing's going to be in my way. Okay, we'll be fine. I'll do it later. Is my head in the way? Okay. So I want to make sure this inside shoulder is, is square. So I'm just using a skew for that. Um, I could have used a skew to, uh, I could have used a skew to make the dovetails. Uh, I find that sometimes I get a little bit more chatter with that than I do with the beading and parting tool. And I just want to make sure that's flat and that's good. Okay? And then uh, now this is where you have to have a design ahead of time because now you need to know where am I going to cut that in half or part that in half. My design, uh, we're going to do one of these tonight. And my design calls for five and a half inches from the bottom. Uh, on my uh, tenons that I cut, notice I didn't make them very small. They're as big as the wood will allow, they're, so they're maximum diameter. And I do that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, because you're going to get the most holding power if you have a, a big tenon. If I reduce that down to you know, that size, I could get a lot of wiggle out on this end when I go to drill and, and turn it and stuff like that. So I do maximum diameter. My design will be done. So some guys will they'll make a tenon, but then farther on in the process, then they have to remove the tenon. But to me, that's just an extra step, so I don't do that. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to part it. I have, a, I have a thin parting tool. Whoops. Turned it off. Turn on. This is a 16th inch parting tool. I use a thin parting tool so I don't lose my grain alignment as much. And never try and part this all the way through. Um, if you were to part this all the way through when the piece is spinning at, you know, 2,000 RPM, it just is going to not be pretty. So I'll come in here part way. And remember, this is an arcing cut that you make. You don't just push straight in. You, you arc it down towards center. Oops. Use your tool rest to stop the piece from spinning, huh? And then we'll... What did I do with my saw? Right here. And then I cut it in half. I release your tail stock so it doesn't uh, bind. And you can do, you could cut this in half on the bandsaw if you want, but I didn't bring my bandsaw tonight, so. And there we go. That was step one. That wasn't so bad, huh? Okay, now we're going to switch over to a chuck. Uh, no. Now, to go with those big tenons, we'll use this one, I have big chucks, and I use these uh, cup chucks or shark jaws or whatever these are called um, because they're nice big diameter, and I actually have, I have the, the uh, this is a Vicmark VM100 chuck, and I've got the two largest sizes that they make, that, uh, that's going to be close, we'll use this size. Uh, and these have another advantage, which I'll get to in a minute. Oh, man, tell me I brought my chuck key. Yeah, right here. That would be bad. All right, so we're going to mount the, this is the base. And we're getting ready to do step two. Let me just see how true that runs. Perfect. Did you guys see that? That was running perfect. Look, 
Look at that. That's perfect. Yeah, you can use regular jaws. You'll just size them for whatever. You know what? Uh, I meant to try that before I came over to use like the standard two, two and a half inch jaws. Certainly use those. You know, you get the most holding power if it's a, it's a you know, complete circle. Um, there's something else I meant to try with that. When we get to a different step, uh, I'll mention it. But yeah, certainly make your, make your chuck, uh, make your tenons for whatever jaws you've got. So, yeah, some of the tools that I've got, you know, I mean, just over the years, I've, I, I bought these because they help me with pepper mills, and I bought them specifically uh, for making pepper mills. So, uh, but like I said, you don't, you don't need to run right out, and, and you don't think that you have to have these just to make a, if you don't have these jaws, you can't make a pepper mill. That's not true. Um, I can true this surface up now, or I can do it later. It doesn't matter. That's that step one, two, three, four. So I'll do it later just because I'm a rebel. I don't know. I'm going to put a tenon on this end. Remember, so this is a surface where I cut them in half. I'm going to put a tenon on this end just so I can start drilling from the bottom. Some guys will drill this hole first, but I, I don't. So I'll use a skew this time to put a, uh, to put a tenon on here just to show that you can use different tools. And it doesn't need to be very big. And to be honest, I never measure my tenons um, because I've got the two different size chucks that will fit. Let's just see how true that runs. Oh, man. Did you see that? You want to see it again? That was perfect. So don't look at this surface. Don't look at this surface. But look at my... Look at my dovetail right there. That thing is just running perfect. <laughs> All right. So very first thing I need to do is drill some holes. Uh, the, and again, the kit that I'm using is the um, deluxe kit from Craft Supply and uh, Where's Don? And, and uh, I did go on to, or I sent you an email about that. Yeah, I did go on to uh, Packard's website, and it's the same kit. Okay. So the manufacturer says that this hole needs to be one and five eighths inch diameter by a half inch deep. So a couple of things. My bit, my bit is a half inch wide. So I don't necessarily need to measure. I can just drill until the back side of the bit is flush with the wood. And this is one and five eighths inch diameter. Um, the other thing I can do, I have the, the B model and for every rotation of the handle, it's a sixteenth of an inch. I think this is an eighth of an inch because I was looking at it and it sure looks like it goes uh, more than mine. But the point of that is on my lathe, I don't, I don't measure, I just count the number of revolutions. Once the, once the wings start cutting, I can just count the revolutions until I get to a half inch. So my speed, uh, and, I, and I don't have the bit touching the wood. To me, that's very important. You'll see a lot of guys, they'll, they'll shove the bit into the wood, then they turn the wood on, and they, or turn the lathe on and they start drilling and their bit's doing one of these, and their wood's doing one of those. Mine doesn't, because I, I don't let it touch. I'm going to let the bit, where did my speed, a little bit fast. I'm going to let the bit center itself and, and register itself. So I go slow, let the point of the bit find its own center, because the shape of the, the bit, or the, uh, the point on the bit is a different shape than what my tail center is. So I want this bit to find its own center. Once the wings start cutting, I'll just count the revolutions. Oh yeah, this is like an eighth of an inch or more. <laughs> if this wiggles a little bit, I don't like it, but it doesn't bother me because I'm going to clean this up. But that's not wiggling very much. So that was like three revolutions. So that's got to be, I don't know what that is. But see, I told you I don't measure, but I will measure that. Okay, that's exactly half an inch. All right, good to know, good to know. So I'm going to switch bits. So now the manufacturer says drill a one and a sixteenth inch hole all the way through. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. 
uh, don't ever try and drill all the way through. Never, ever try and drill all the way through, no matter how big or short this is. Always drill from both sides. It will never uh, match. It will never be as, as, I don't want to keep using the word perfect, but your hole will never be as good as it will be if you come from both sides. The highly figured wood and all that kind of stuff, the grain will grab your bit. The farther it gets in there, it'll grab your bit, and it'll start pushing it off center. It, and it may come out in the center on this side, but I guarantee it's not going to be round. It's, it's going to be a little bit oval-shaped. So even on my small pepper mill like this, I still drilled halfway, and then I came in from the other side and drilled halfway. All right, so back to this. The manufacturer says drill a, a one and a sixteenth inch hole. This is a one inch bit. It's a carbide bit. Drilling into end grain is, is tough stuff. And uh, some of the uh, less expensive bits, the cheaper bits, they'll smoke and the, they won't cut cleanly and you'll have to really, you know, two-handed to just get it to drill. If you're going to make more than a couple of pepper mills, I think it really does pay to buy a good bit. Um, but now this, this is a bore, uh, FAMAG, F-A-M-A-G, and it's the Bormax line. Uh, they make a Bormax 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. The 3.0 is the carbide. So this is a, a Bormax 3.0 one inch carbide bit. Nobody makes a one and a sixteenth inch bit. So I'll have to use something else for that. But I'm gonna use this to remove the bulk. And then, uh, then I'll come in and clean it up with the one and a sixteenth. So again, my speed is five to 600 RPM. Notice that I stopped short. I don't know if you guys can see that. What if I did that? Is that? Does that wash out the camera? Kind of? Not bad? Not too bad? Okay, how about that? Is that better? All right. So I go slow. I let the bit get established. If this bit wiggles a little bit, again, I'm okay with that because I'm going to enlarge it later. It's also, important, it's also important to clear the chips, right? Because you don't, if, if you don't clear the chips, you get in here a ways, it's going to bind up that bit, and it'll yank it out of your, your quill and everything. So a lot of guys, they'll drill an inch or so, and then they'll back it out, and they'll blow out the chips, and then they shove it into the piece again, and they'll drill some more and back it out, blow out the chips. Well, if you're gonna, that's one way to do it, but if you're going to blow the chips out, why don't you just do it while you're drilling? So I just, I got a compressor right next, or a air nozzle right next to my lathe, and I just blow the chips out as I'm drilling. The air will uh, keep the bit a little bit cooler. And it saves all that having to withdraw the, the bit and clean it out and all that kind of stuff. All right, so that was a one inch. So now I'm going to switch to a one and a sixteenth. And this is the Bormax 2.0, which is just a step down. It's got some, you know, features on it that make it a good bit also. Um, does anybody in here own the Colt MaxiCut Forstner bits? Yeah, those are good bits also. I've got those also. Those were the first set I bought. Uh, the Colt doesn't make those anymore. Did you know that? Yeah, they stopped making them. So if you've got a set, hold on to them or don't get rid of them because you can't get them anymore. So this is a, 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 a Bormax 2.0, and I've got it mounted in a Morse taper adapter. And the reason I have it in an adapter is now I can drill up until the ram hits the, the wood. And this lets me drill four inches long, or four inches deep. Well, my blank is only five and a half inches, so I can easily come from both ends and meet in the middle. If I have a, a longer piece of wood and I need to drill more, well, then it just so happens that the Colt uh, adapter in their bit lets me drill up to five inches. So I, I can make a 10-inch mill easily without using any kind of an extension. There, I have extensions, I have never used them. I bought them 
because I thought you had to have them, but I've never used them. The um, typical sizes that I make are the, the 6, 8, and 10. And so you think, well, you need a 10-inch extension to make a 10-inch mill. But remember, you probably have like maybe a 2-inch head, and your body of the mill is only 8 inches, so I can easily drill without using an extension, using the uh, Morse taper adapter. All right. So I want you to look at something. And I, again, I'm going to put the camera up there and hope I don't wash it out. So if you go watch some YouTube videos, and maybe you've experienced this yourself, people start drilling and, and their bit will start wandering like that, right? Watch my bit and you tell me how much it wanders. And I, I won't even touch it. Don't make a liar out of me, but I won't even touch it. Is it it's seating, the, the uh, ram is seating. Is it wiggling at all? It doesn't wiggle at all, and it, it never does. And the reason is because I've removed all that bulk with that one-inch carbide, and now all this was doing is going from one inch to one and a sixteenth. There's no pressure, there's no stress on this bit. And that's the end of the one inch. I could go a little bit deeper if I want, but I got to blow some chips out. I really, I really like this hand wheel. It like speeds up all the drilling. Okay, your other tip for the day, for the night, stop the piece from spinning when you withdraw this bit. Like you don't want to have this spinning as you pull this bit out. The uh, one and a sixteenth is where the grinding mechanism mounts, and I want a perfect one and a sixteenth inch hole. If I pull this out while the the wood is still spinning, have you ever done that and you've seen a little curly cue? A little pigtail coming off of the bit, that means that the bit is still cutting. So maybe your centers aren't perfectly aligned or something, and the edge of the bit is just like scraping that wall, and it's enlarging, enlarging? It's making bigger that one in a sixteenth inch hole. So turn it off and, uh, and pull the bit out. I like this hand wheel because, yeah, it doesn't take as much revolutions. Okay. So now, and this is why I brought the camera, or the, uh, vid, the uh, light. Can you see that tear out? Does that show up? That's pretty good, isn't that? That's, what do you guys think? Should I just leave it like that? Think I can sand that out? <laughs> yeah, we'd be here until next Tuesday, next Thursday. Don't ever try and sand that. There's no way you can sand that out. You've got to cut it out or scrape it out. Scraping end grain works really well if you've never done that. So I want to do a couple of things. I'm going to I'm going to clean up this surface. Although it's pretty clean, I want to make sure that it's true, uh, running true, and I want to undercut it slightly. I'm going to get rid of all that, tear out, and I'm going to clean up this other hole that I've drilled. And you can time me to see how long it takes me to do all this. So the first thing I'll do is we can, uh, so that's flat. I want it undercut. It's, it's not running perfectly true, so I'm just going to use a, I'll just use a gouge. You can use a scraper, spindle gouge, whatever you'd like. And I'm just going to true that up and undercut it just slightly. And if you want to uh, shear scrape it, you can do that too. I'm not getting much shear there, am I? That looks good. And it's undercut just slightly, which is what I want. Okay, let's clean up those surfaces. So what I do is I scrape it. You could probably get a spindle gouge in there. If you put the lathe in reverse, you could probably get your spindle gouge in there and cut it that way, or otherwise you'd have to go like this. But I use a couple of skews to do that with. So I've got, I've got two skews. I don't know if we're the, where do I need, do I need to put a hand behind them? So I've got two skews, and I call this my right and my left skew. And they're, they're identical, but that doesn't, that's not important. But I've got the burr on the top 
of my right hand skew and I've got the burr on the top of my left hand skew. So depending on which angle I'm presenting it to the wood determines which tool I'll grab. They're in different handles just so I can tell looking at them which one I, I'm picking up. If your lathe turns in reverse, then you can, you can just stand like this and I'm going to scrape that opposite wall right there. I, I don't want to tell you how long, <laughs> how many years I used to do this and reach over it and I, because I was always scraping that inside wall. And then one day I said, hey, you know, if I stand up straight, I can see what I'm doing and I can just sc scrape it this way. So take it in. Tools should be cutting on center height. I don't know if the camera sees that or not. I'm too high now. And then just take little, little bites and work your way across. And then you can go back and forth. Okay, and let's see, let's see how we did. Got a little bit more right on that outside edge. Oh yeah, there's a bunch right there still, okay. Let's see how that did. Fire away. Oh, these are Carter and Son. Uh, oh, who makes the skews? Uh, Carter and Son. And these are the half inch, they're half inch skews. How'd I do? Oh, yeah. Not bad. How long did that take? Not much at all, right? Okay, so now, let's see what my lathe reposition. And I'm just going to comment. This is the uh, Steve Sinner Advanced Lathe Tool Rest. I used to have a robust rest that I used to do this with. The robust rest, this part comes out farther, comes out towards the edge. With the advanced, uh, advanced lathe tools, I can, I can get it in deeper into my recess. So for, for doing this work it works well okay I picked up the other skew now with the burr on the right hand side I'm still going in reverse and now we're going to clean up we'll clean up this wall right here and make that run true and remember when it was drilling I said if the hole wiggles a little bit it's okay because I'm going to clean it up that's what I'm going to do right now let's make it let's go And we'll just take little bites and work our way towards center, or uh, towards the end. And we'll see how that does. Get this. How'd I do? A little bit on that inside edge, just right in the very end. Right there. How's that look? Looks pretty good to me. Question. I I am changing the diameter a little bit which doesn't matter because this, is, this big hole is just a clearance hole for the mechanism to fit down into. Um, the depth, I'm, I don't know if, uh, th when I drill, normally I go a half inch and then I give it just a little bit extra uh, just because I know that I'm going to undercut it. But th that's, that's one thing. That's a good question, though. So the question was, uh, you know, I was being real precise or by, by cleaning up the holes, didn't I change their size and their depth? And I would say, you know what? Don't get too hung up on that. Um, I shouldn't do that. Don't get too hung up on your on your depth and and the sizes and stuff like that because you do you really do have some wiggle room with the mechanism and with the mill. There's there's always a way to fix something. If you drill a hole too deep, not deep enough, you know, if your mill comes out too short, too long, 
you can always get a longer mechanism. You can, you can cut the rod and make it fit the mill. Um, this measurement that I've got right here, I haven't changed it that much, at an eighth of an inch maybe at most. Uh, and I've got that kind of wiggle room in the mechanism, if you will. Yeah, so I, don't, get, don't get too hung up on this hole being exact. Now, the one in a sixteenth inch hole, this hole right in here, right in the very center, I don't touch that. I got a perfect one in a sixteenth inch hole, I leave it alone. And you might look at it and say, well, it looks kind of rough. You know what? It doesn't matter because the mechanism will cover that up. So nobody will ever see that. But they will see the bottom and the, the, two, the other edges that I cut. And who was it? Was it? Yeah, that, so that's my, that's my tip for you today. Clean it up. And uh, Vince, we were talking about what sets the difference or uh, uh, what are some of the things that, that make a, a mill 50 or $75 versus 150 or 175 In my opinion, this is one of them. Have you ever picked up a mill and it looks beautiful on the outside and you turn it over and you look at the bottom and it, it's rough? They, it's so, you know, it's rough from the drill. They didn't even sand it. They didn't even finish it. Well, can you, can you charge $200 for a mill that looks like that? No, I don't, I don't think you can. So this is one of the things that, that will help you uh, elevate your pepper mills, one thing anyway. Any other questions? Yes. I, I have never had a problem with a chuck coming off on my small or my big uh, Vic marks. I never have locked them in. I, I never have had a problem, not once. Yeah, good question. So you're talking about the grub screws on the... I never have done that, never had a problem. All right, I want, I want to uh, bevel this edge real quick just because we don't want to have a sharp edge there, do we? I like a bevel. Uh, you could do a round over. I'm going to hit that inside one in the 16th. I'll just hit that real quick, just lightly. And then I'll do a little bit bigger bevel right here. Can you guys see that bevel? And that's why I do a bevel, because you can see it. If it was a round over, it would just, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't, I mean, but a bevel, nice crisp edges, you can see that. So now I would sand the bottom. I'm going to turn my speed down. These surfaces are cut so clean that uh, I typically start sanding. Oops, not, not that slow. I was going to go to 220 there. I typically start sanding at 220 grit. And because they're cut so clean, literally, it takes that long. And I'm serious. That's how much time I spend sanding at home. Blow your dust off in between grits. We'll go to 320. And so on, so, uh, so on up the grits. I, I go to 1,000 uh, grit when I sand. Um, this surface right here, I do not sand. I leave it alone. I scrape it clean, and I let it go. Uh, it's a real booger to try and sand that, first of all. If you do have to sand it, uh, make sure the end of your sandpaper is rounded. So round, you know, cut your sandpaper round and then try and get in there, but I don't ever mess with that. When I put the mechanism in place, it's going to cover up half of that surface anyway, and the very first time they use it, pepper dust will cover the rest of the hole. So I figure as long as it's sand, it's uh, scraped clean, uh, it, it's good. These surfaces, they can see and they can feel, and uh, so I, I send those to a 1,000, and you could put sanding sealer on it now if you wanted to or something like that. Uh-huh, question. Like, like what Mike Mahoney does? No, I don't. I don't. Oh, do I ever hollow, hollow out the body to, to hold more pepper? Yeah. And, and no, I don't. And one of the arguments is, is it's just a screw that you have to remove if it gets empty, right? Um, and, uh, but no, I don't. I don't ever hollow. I have some blanks at home that are about four inches in diameter, and I thought I'd try that. But Mike Mahoney's pepper mills are you ever seen them in person they're big they're fat man so no i don't but 
Okay, we're all, we're all done with the bottom. We need to reverse it and drill from the other side. Force a habit, I always mark my number one jaw. Uh, just in case I need to remount it and do something here. But I don't know if that shows up. There's, there's my bottom. Let's see how we're doing. Oh, man, I tell you. <laughs> this thing is running just perfectly true. I brought silver maple just to show you how much that uh, tear out can happen when you drill. But I also brought it to, uh, to show you how easy it is to clean up, too. All right, I'm going to true up this surface now. You can see that's all bad from being parted. And I want to undercut this as well, so you could use a spindle gouge, bowl gouge, whatever you got, whatever, whatever you like. Now, granted, a lot of this surface out here will get turned away when I, when I shape the mill. Just trying to undercut that slightly. And of course, the center is going to get drilled out. So we'll just see how we did. Eh, still got some tear out. We'll fix that in a minute, but that is undercut. Okay, let's drill another hole coming from the other side. So just like the first time, I'm going to use a, a one inch bit to remove the bulk. And then I'll uh, come in and enlarge it. So again, I stopped the bit short. Five to 600 RPM. Make sure that's seated. Let the bit get established. Find its own center. And I can see that's wiggling just a little bit, but again, that's, that's okay, because I'll come along with the one and a sixteenth. Oh, we just broke through, too. That's as, obviously as far as I can go with that bit. I usually don't extend my ram all the way either. Uh, just because I think the shorter, the, the better. The shorter, the stiffer. The shorter, the stiffer. The stiffer it will be if the shorter it is. Okay, this is the one and a sixteenth. Stop short and let it. Nice, perfect one and sixteenth inch hole. And notice I'm not in a hurry when I drill either. Some guys on YouTube, man, they're like, they're just going to town. You got to let the bit cut the wood. You don't want to just force it through the hole. And then you heard it where we just uh, met the other hole. Now, if you pull this one out with it under power, it's okay because I don't have a mechanism that's mounting there. So just that bottom hole is the one where I turn it off. All right, something else that I do. You guys save your old sandpaper, don't you? Your used sandpaper, do you save it or do you throw it away? It's all over the floor. It's all over the floor? You're supposed to use it once and throw it away. You know that, right? Everybody throws theirs away, right? Yeah, well, obviously I don't either. So I'm going to sand the inside. Let me blow my, let me get my uh, little disc out. Oh, it blew out already. I sand the inside, but I don't get real crazy with it. I, a 120 grit is fine. I just have a dowel with a, a slot that I cut in the center, and I put some <laughs> tape around it for a cushion. Don't stick your fingers in here. To, don't, stick your, don't wrap sandpaper around your finger and do that. You, you can do that, but you can only do it 10 times, right? <laughs> and I just want to get rid of the fuzzies. Um, I don't want to sand down here because that's where that mechanism is going to go. And I was real particular about that one in a 16th inch hole. So I'm only going to come in about this far. And I've just got some marks on my, 
on my dowel to, uh, to help me not go very far. That's not going to work. No, it's, it's my lamp is in the way. You know, okay, I was going to say, wait, let's see if that's enough room. That'll work. I don't need, actually, I don't need the lamp for this anyway. So I'm just going to keep this parallel with the ways. Yeah, that'll work. Thanks. And I'm just going to go back and forth. If there, where the two holes meet in the middle, if there is a little ridge, you can sand that out. And you can usually feel that. And then I'll just hit that opening a little bit. Don't get too crazy with this because um, you will enlarge this hole by sanding. Even that little bit, I bet I enlarged it. Uh, but also, if you do enlarge it, you're thinking, well, that's no big deal. Uh, but you're probably not going to be able to enlarge it perfectly. It'll be a little bit oblong. The other reason that I sand that is when a customer takes the head off to put pepper in there, I want them to see a smooth surface. I don't want it to be nice and rough from the drill bit. So again, you can't charge $200 if, it, if the inside is all rough like that, in my opinion. Um, also, all of these mating surfaces where the head and the body come together and they rotate, the smoother they are, then the smoother the head's going to rotate as well. I don't, you, you don't need to go crazy. You don't need to sand it to 1,000 grit inside or anything like that. I, like I said, I just use 120 grit, and I just want to get rid of the fuzzies and just make it a little bit smoother. Uh, now I'm ready to start sanding, but uh, I still had a little bit of tear out here, didn't I? So I'll show you, I'll show you that scraper again. So this is my, my scraper that's got the burr on the left side. I grind my scrapers with a straight profile. They don't have any kind of a curve on the edge. And that lets me just go back and forth and scrape that end grain uh, to clean it up. So I can just go back and forth like this. Now the downside of using a, a scraper or using the skew as a scraper is you're cutting with the burr, you know, and the burr doesn't last very long. So it's not uncommon for me to go to the grinder several times while I'm making a mill. How's that look? A couple of passes and we're done, right? So now we're ready to sand it. Again, you could start hitting that with uh, 220 grit. Just touch this outside edge and I'd go all the way up to 1,000. I'd put a little profile or a little uh, bevel right here again, just a little one, not crazy or anything. When I, and a lot of times I will sand that bevel, but I'll, I'll start with like 400 grit and, and I, you know, fold my paper in thirds. Everybody knows about that, right? Folding your paper in thirds. And then I curl it just a little bit like that and that stiffens it up because if I'm gonna, you know, I just got done making a bevel or a chamfer, whatever word you want to use, if you stiffen it up, then you're going to sand just the bevel. If I just was to go like this, I'd probably round over both edges, on the, uh, both edges of the bevel. And then you could put sanding sealer on it. And that's the base. What questions do you have about the base? Anything? Pretty straightforward, huh? All right. Now we're going to, so this is the top, and you can see that's the surface that I, where I sawed them in half and parted it in half. So now I'm going to create a spigot that will go into this hole. So whatever size this is, I'll make something that will match. But now I, I threw a new word out there, right? I called this a spigot, but I've been referring to these as tenons. Is there a difference? What's the difference between a tenon and a spigot? Or is there a difference? I know a lot of people use, use them interchangeably and all. Is there a difference, anybody? Water comes out of a spigot. Out of a spigot. <laughs> I Googled it. You can Google anything, right? I Googled it, and it says that a spigot is straight, and a tenon is dovetailed. And in this book, uh, this reference book, which is an excellent book, by the way, Turning Salt and Pepper Shakers and Mills by Chris West, he, he explains that as well, and he refers to it as a spigot also. And I like that analogy because when I'm referring to a spigot, now you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. If I called this a tenon, but I was calling all these other things tenons, you'd be like, 
What are you talking about? You know, you got four different tenons there. What, which one do you mean? Yes, question. I'm, is a, so a spigot is something you would not use in the turn P? You're not going to use the spigot. That's correct. That is a true statement. Some guys on YouTube will, though. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. I'll, I'll get there in a minute. So I need, to, I need to reduce this diameter down and make a spigot that fits in here. So I'm going to use my beading and parting tool again. You can use uh, whatever tools you want. And again, this is an arcing cut. This spigot doesn't have to be an inch long. I make mine three-eighths of an inch long, which is more than enough, but that's also as wide as my tool is, so I don't ever have to measure. I can just make it as, as wide as my tool is. I need to measure that, though, don't I? You guys were waiting for me to do that. You're like, well, how does he know what size to make? So this was a one and a sixteenth inch hole that I drilled, right? And I enlarged it by a thirty-second, just by that little bit of sanding that I did. So I'm going to set my caliper for just a hair over that. And I've, you can use those um, hourglass-shaped calipers as well. I just started using these because I like the accuracy and I can dial in a number on it. And I have rounded over the points just a little bit. When you, when you do this, hold the calipers, and no matter which kind you use, and hold them in the back. Don't, don't hold them on top here. The tendency to on top is that you'll be shoving them down over the top, and you can distort that reading. But I have it just... I have them just barely touching in back, and I'm just going to do a little bit at a time. Just like that. Then we'll do the other. Bring that down to match. Now, if I did that right, this will not fit over that because I set my calipers a little... Uh-oh. I was going to say I set my calipers a little bit larger. Everybody says you have to make a jam chuck right here, right? This has to be a tight fit so that you uh, can jam these two together to turn them. Well, I don't have a tight fit, do I? I don't make a tight fit. I jam them together, but I'll show you how I do that later. So now I'm going to use my skew that has the uh, burr on the top, and I'm going to scrape this. Scraping this... Work, you don't want, to, don't want to do a peeling cut. Hold it straight and just basically I'm taking off sawdust. And I can go back and forth, just taking off sawdust. I like using a skew for this because the point of the skew gets into that corner. If I was using my beading and parting tool, it would always be hitting up against that shoulder. So I'm just going to do a, a nice little scrape, take some sawdust off. Let's see how it fits now. Because if you remove wood, it makes it tighter, right? <laughs> That's my final fit right there. So can you see that? I got a little bit of wiggle, a little, little bit of movement there. That's my final fit. I don't, I'm not going to do anything more with that except maybe hit it with some 400-grit paper. So a lot of guys will, again, they'll do a real tight fit, and then when they get all done shaping the outside of the mill, then they say, well, just sand that a little bit more. Just sand this hole a little bit more. Put some wax on there. We'll just work it in. I don't have to do any of that stuff. Yes, Chris, question. Are you going to put sanding sealer on that? You sure could if you wanted to, yeah. Is that going to change the dimension at all? The sanding sealer? Yes, it could. And, that's, and I've kind of taken that into a, uh, account with my, um, with my uh, looseness that I have here. It's not looseness. It's a... Uh, it's, it's not a sloppy fit, it's a loose fit, yeah. But I've got enough room in there that if I oil that or put sanding sealer on it, it's still going to work okay. And there was a Zoom question? Was, was there a Zoom question? Okay. Yeah, so I don't ever have to, uh, have to, t to uh, wax that or sand it again or do anything like that. 
You guys have all used a, a pepper mill where the top squeaks, right? Why does it squeak? It's too tight. The spigot is too tight, and it's rubbing against each other. So my mills never squeak because, because I've, uh, I've, in, I've guaranteed that. They're not the same size. I do want to clean up this surface, uh, and then I'm going to do something there. I could do that first and this. So what I was saying earlier about, oh, don't get too, you know, do I do step one, two, three, four, one, two, four, three? It doesn't matter. I'll use a spindle gouge this time. I'm just going to clean that up, and we'll slightly undercut it. And, well, where's my ruler at? Oh, it's not undercut. Yes, so I have this undercut, and I don't know if that shows up in the camera or not, but it's, it's uh, higher here than it is in the middle. So it's undercut, and that, that guarantees, and this surface is undercut as well, so that guarantees that the mill is always going to, that the, the edges of the mill are always going to be riding the outside. So that's why you undercut the bottom also, that no matter what shape this ends up being, it's always going to be hitting on the high point. So if I... If I undercut it like that, no matter what size that is, it's always going to be on the high point, whether it's that big or, how do I do this, or, you know, or that big, that big or that big, doesn't matter, it's always going to be hitting the outside surface. And the same thing with this, that no matter what these profiles end up being, they're always going to be hitting the outside surface. And that's how you get a tight fit between the top and the bottom. I'm going to... Get rid of that little goober right there. That's all that takes. Now, the next thing we're going to do is, is fit. Uh, this is called a turn plate or a drive plate. And a lot of guys will just, like, center that on the end of the spigot, and they'll drill some holes and screw that in place. I don't do it that way because that's not very accurate. So what I'm going to do next is drill a hole to recess that plate. Oh, that's not what I want. I want to Half hour. Thanks. That means I need to stop talking and i got to hurry up. The drive plate or the turn plate is seven eighths of an inch, a little bit bigger than seven eighths of an inch. So I've got a seven eighths of an inch bit that uh, I'll drill seven eighths of an inch and then I'll enlarge it. This only needs to be, you know, three sixteenths of an inch deep. On my lathe, that's three revolutions, and I think on this one, it's probably one and a half. That's good. And while I'm drilling, let's drill a hole for the. Uh, drive for the rod that goes all the way up through the head. But I'm only going to drill, I was drilling too fast, I'm only going to drill halfway again, and then I'll come in from the other side. Let this bit get established. There we go. Nice and easy like that. Hold on to your chuck so it doesn't uh, pull out. And then I would sand that surface. I would not sand the spigot until I get to 400 grit. So I do 220, 320, and then I, when I get to 400, then I would touch the uh, spigot. And I would just, and the only reason I'm sanding it is just to, you know, just to make it a little bit smoother. A little bit like that, like that and so on. Okay, my drive plate doesn't fit, but I need to enlarge the hole. So the way we enlarge holes is we scrape them. 
So if you want to make a pepper mill, but you don't have an inch and a sixteenth bit, you can use a one inch bit and then just enlarge it like this. I got my skew hitting about nine o'clock and I'm going to use the I'm going to use the point and this surface to scrape. And I'm keeping the tool parallel with the ways and I'm just going in ever so lightly. And this usually takes me half a dozen times to, uh, to get it to fit. So you remember the, uh, the one and a sixteenth inch hole that I was drilling originally in the base? And I, don't, I told you I don't touch it, I don't sand it afterwards because that, I want that hole to be perfect because the mechanism mounts in that hole. Well, this is part of the mechanism. So I want a perfect fit. I want that to drop down just a, all the way. I don't want to have to force it. And just be careful. Even though you're in a demo, you can't hurry up. One more time. One more cut. Let me clean up that surface. And you can see how little I'm taking off. Was my head in the way? You can see how little I'm taking off. Just really sawdust more than anything. There we go. Down in the bottom. So now when that drive rod comes up through the center, it, my, my spigot is going to be perfectly centered in the base. My drive plate is centered within the spigot. And my hole that I drilled is perfectly centered as well. So you're pretty much guaranteeing your top is going to align with the base. I'm going to put a quick tenon on here so I can drill from the other side. What's that? Oh, yeah. It'll, the alignment is key on pepper mills. If that, if that drive plate is off just a little bit, your head will do all kinds of wonky things. It won't fit right, and uh, your gap won't be uh, your gap won't be, be uh, between the head. It won't be very good. It'll be tight on one side and and higher on another. This hole that I'm drilling right now also causes that. If this hole is not centered, it can cock your head off to one side. Drilling good, nice and centered. Sounds like we're all the way through. So the drive shaft is uh, a quarter of an inch big, thick. And some of the directions will tell you to drill a quarter inch hole. Well, if you have a quarter inch hole and you're shoving a quarter inch shaft through it, how well do you think that will fit? So this is just a little bit larger. A quarter of an inch is the same thing as 16 64ths. And I know this because I've been helping my granddaughter with her fractions. And <laughs> so 16 64ths, the drill I just used was a 17 64ths. If you don't have, which is kind of a funny size, if you don't have a 17 64ths, next step up is 18 64ths, which is the same thing as 9 30 seconds. So 17 64ths or 9 30 seconds. Uh, I would not drill any larger than that. I'm going to do one thing before I take it off. The design that I'm going to make has kind of an undercut edge, uh, undercut top, so I might as well do that now. So just a little, just a shallow cove, and you could scrape this if you feel like it. And that is the end of step two. Step two always takes the longest. Now is a good time to check your fit, uh, your length. 
I, there's all kinds of ways to adjust this. You know, I can drill this hole deeper. I can take more wood off. I can get a longer mechanism, things like that. But if I don't have to do any of that, why would I? Well, to check your fit, you would have to partially assemble the mechanism. You'd have to get the, the male grinder, the female grinder, the, the shaft, and all that. So I just made up these little guide rods, or whatever you call them, and I've got them for, you know, 4, 6, 8, and 10 inch, which are the size mills I make. The distance from here to here is the same length as an 8 inch rod. So I don't have to uh, handle a bunch of different mechanism parts just to check my fit. I can just check it just like that quick. And I'm looking for between a quarter to three-eighths of an inch sticking out of the top. And that's, that's good right there. Uh, the reason you need some sticking out of the top is when they remove the top, the, the nut, and then they want to fill this, it's, the mechanism is spring-loaded, and it's going to drop down a bit. So you want to make sure they have some threads there to screw the top back on. So that speeds things up a little bit. Okay. So step three now is to shape the outside profile. What's that? Oh, you need a chair? So a lot of instructions will tell you to make a jam chuck, a wooden jam chuck, which works great if you're only going to make one or two. But if you're going to make more than one, then these long nose jaws work really well because they'll just expand right into that big one and five eighths inch hole. And it doesn't matter if that hole, if the size of that hole changed at all or not, because they'll fit into it. So I told you I was going to jam chuck my top and my bottom. Well, I'm going to take a little tip here from box makers. And if I'm box makers, don't they use a, a Kleenex or something? tissue to jam the top to the bottom. So I'm going to do something like that. So I'm just going to push. So this is just a shop towel. You can use a paper towel. I made a little indent in that. I don't know if you can see that. And now I'm going to cut about a quarter of an inch outside that. These are just blue shop towels. I like them better than a regular paper towel because they're more consistent thickness. Paper towels work, but sometimes they get a lot of quilting, you know, patterns and stuff like that in them. You can, you can pick up a roll of these at auto stores, auto parts stores and stuff. So basically what I'm making, think of a, uh, a bottle cap. So I want this paper towel to come up the sides, and I don't know that the camera is going to see that or not. I don't know if you can see that. I want it to come up the sides of the spigot and stop. I don't want it so long that it overflows onto the adjoining surface. I might be able to get away with a little bit because, because these mating surfaces are undercut. But uh, uh, I it's, you'd be surprised how little it takes to uh, throw it off if it comes out onto those mating surfaces. Oh, I don't care that the grain's not aligned. Nope. So now you can put that cone center back on your lathe, on your revolving center. Now, my revolving center came with a metal cone. Metal will leave a black ring. No matter which hole you're chucking it in, it leaves a black ring. And I did that I, you know, you have to sand that up. And I didn't like that. So I made, I said, okay, I'll make one of these out of wood. Well, what happens if it slips? Wood against wood, what happens? burns. <laughs> so I got some of that high density plastic or whatever it is and I made one out of it and even though it's black plastic it doesn't leave a mark. Doesn't melt, doesn't burn. It works fantastic. I can true it up if I, if I hit it with a gouge or something I can true it up. Okay I'm going I'm to get rid of a couple of these tools. Now we'll see how fast I can turn. 20 minutes. Oh, I got plenty of time then. So I'm I'm going to make a I'm going to make a simple shape like this. Uh, and the reason I'm making a simple shape is because it's quick to turn when I'm running behind in the demo. You're not You're perfect. I'm perfect. So I'm going to I'm just going to 
Oh, by the way, look at how true my two pieces are, are running together. Can you see that? I, I, I got to give myself a double pat on the back. They're, they're perfect. And they're perfect. Why? Because I've made sure that my, my spigot and my holes and everything was just as, as true and accurate as I could, could make it. That's why I say alignment is, uh, alignment is key. All right, the design that I'm going to make, I've, I've got it drawn out at home, but I've made this so many times, I, uh, I know what the measurements are. Whoop. That's why I usually use this. I want to mark there, and I want to mark... Wait, where's my one and five-eighths? Right there. Okay, this design and the, the, the uh, size depends on the mechanism or the uh, mill that I'm making. So a six inch mill will have different diameters than an eight inch, than a 10 inch and so forth. I'm gonna use a diamond parting tool. You guys all know what this is, right? This is the only time I use a diamond parting tool. <laughs> And the reason I use it here is because it's wide enough that it lets my calipers fit down in the hole. And I can just do it in one shot. I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, going back and forth. I want the same measurement up here on the head. And now I want... And again, I'm setting these... Uh, Diameters for just a little bit above the uh, final diameter. Uh oh. I was taking a pretty heavy cut. That, I gotta say, whether you believe it or not, that is the very first time I've ever had one slip. And that's the truth. That's because I'm trying to hurry. So now it's just a matter of let's let's remove wood down to the uh, down to those lines. You can use a bowl gouge. You can use whatever you're comfortable with. That's way too fast. Something else I was going to tell you. So I I was using a blue paper towel, something that I just ran across. Uh, a couple weeks ago that works even better yet is a gun cleaning patch. If any of you guys have guns, the gun cleaning patches are 100% cotton. They're stronger than a paper towel. They're consistent thickness and I can reuse them four and five times whereas a lot of times on a, on a uh, blue towel I can only use it a, sometimes just once and that's it. Try and keep all my shavings out of the way here. And I usually work the, uh, let's see if this will work faster. I usually work the whole profile back and forth. I don't just concentrate in one area because I think it's better to, to get an uh, idea of the whole overall look. So I told you that uh, over the years I've acquired a couple of tools that have helped me make pepper mills, and this is one of them. This is a, um, it's a three-quarter inch roughing gouge. And I got it from D-Way. I got it in a Trent Bosch handle, and it's just uh, not that you have to have it in a Trent Bosch handle, but I was, if he was here tonight, I would have, you know, sucked up to him. And uh, it uh, makes a good... Uh, I, I bought this uh, for making pepper mills because it lets me do nice flowing curves. So you could use a spindle gouge, you can use the bowl gouge, but this just lets me, because it's got a broader nose, it lets me do uh, smoother curves. I also have bought a, uh, it's called a low profile spindle gouge from Carter and Son, and I love it. And I bought that to help me with uh, flowing curves also. 
You got to continue to tighten this up because as I remove wood, back to why are they undercut? As, as I remove wood, then those surfaces are getting shorter and shorter and I got to keep bringing them together. Have any of you heard of a guy named Vic Firth? F-I-R-T-H, Vic Firth? Have you? Oh yeah, Don, you would. So Don, you probably know more about him than I do. Vic was a uh, percussionist with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. A, a what? Timphony? Tim, what is that? Is that a drum? A kettle drum. Higher pay job. Well, Vic had a, he's not a wood turner, but he was the, with the Boston Orchestra, Boston Symphony Orchestra, but he started a company, the Vic Firth Company, and they made drumsticks, wooden drumsticks. And apparently they were pretty nice drumsticks and, uh, you know, some real famous drummers used them and all that. Oh, is that right? You've used them too? And, uh, but the point of this is that Vic also then started making pepper mills. And this is a shape that Vic made, that his company made. And uh, Vic has passed on now, but he sold the company to Fletcher's Mill. So if you go to www.fletcher's mill, you'll see this shape uh, that they still make today and still sell. I don't want to use that. Now, what I think is kind of interesting is if you look at this shape, this shape is real similar to this base, isn't it? Only it's a, just elongated and it's stretched out a little bit, right? A little bit bigger head. But basically, this is the base. I've been making this base design or style, shape, whatever, since I took that class. So I wonder, do you think it's possible that maybe Vic saw one of my pepper mills and that gave him the inspiration for this? I, I doubt it, but if you want to think that, then I mean, I can't tell you what to think, so. But it's like, a, it's a classic profile, I guess I would call it that. Just wanted to undercut that. Okay. And we're just about done. Now, one other thing that I do. I always do is I use a negative rake scraper. And Ted Sokolowski, the DVD up here, excellent DVD, by the way. Ted calls, Ted sells his own line of uh, negative rake scrapers, and uh, he calls them finesse scrapers. So all he's going to do, uh, the way he refers to it, is he's just finessing the curve, and he's just going to get rid of any, any lines, any humps, bumps, that kind of stuff. And uh, using a negative rake scraper will... Uh, reduce your sanding time as well. You don't have to start with 80 grit. I never start with 80 grit. And this helps me get a nice pleasing curve right there. And I can scrape that a little bit. And that is step three, shape the outside profile. So now step four is sand and finish. And I'm, I'm going I'm to show you a couple of things on sanding. I'm, actually, I'm not done. I want to do one more thing, two more things. How much time do I have? Mm -hmm. Ten minutes? I'm, I'm good. I am good. Let's put, uh, let's put a little bit of definition wherever this joint is right here and so let's just do a little V cut oops now I was taking some pretty pretty aggressive cuts there when I was shaping this wasn't I so you have 
I mean, you, you can't get too crazy because it is just a jam fit. But if you have a good jam fit, I wasn't really babying it. I kind of forgot about it. I was in a hurry, so... I always put a chamfer on the bottom. Every one of my mills has got a chamfer on the bottom. That's a design standpoint. It, it gives lift to the mill. It doesn't just come down and, and uh, sit on the, on the table. It gives it a little bit of lift. And I'm, but that, yeah. You've seen mills like that, right? Let's do one more little V-cut. hard to do without any light but yeah, we're good and this is about the only time you'll see me use a skew and you can tell I'm not very good at it my very first pepper mill that I made 20 years ago yeah you should have seen me use a skew then it was not pretty there we go all right now I would start sanding those are just little details of mine so now I'd start sanding and I'm going to turn it in reverse so dust goes towards you guys um, cl use cloth back paper uh, as opposed to paper back paper you know this this is paper back paper uh, what I found is that the cloth back is a little bit easier on the edge if you're sanding if you've ever sanded a spindle and sometimes you get a little, a little line from the sand, edge of the sandpaper. But the cloth back is a little bit more forgiving, and it, uh, it doesn't show those lines. And also hold it at an angle. Don't hold it uh, perpendicular. Hold it at an angle, and it kind of eases up those, those uh, curves and, and joints. Come right up to the tip there. Don't, don't round that over. Now, the other thing that I like... Doug Schneider's here, right? Is he still here? Doug, you said you like the um, sanding sponges, right? And, and I love the sanding sponges, too. Sorry, I didn't have any set out. So I like sanding sponges. So these are, several companies make them, but these are um, the Festool, Festool sanding sponges. And, and Woodcraft sells them. They're kind of pricey. They come in a, a big roll of like, what, 80 yards or something like that. And it's like $72, $76 per grit. And they go up to 800 though. Well, then I take one of these and I cut, them, I cut it into thirds. And so then, let's see, that's not the... This is a different brand, but I'll cut that that strip into thirds, and then I use the, sand pa the uh, sanding sponge for sanding spindles. And this, just like the cloth paper, the edge is kind of forgiving. It never shows marks, and the foam kind of keeps your fingers from heating up as well. I got to say, you, you probably better be serious about making pepper mills if you, if you go this route, because, you know, $72 for a box per grit and they make 120, 150, 180, 240, 320, 400, 500, 600, 800. Five. So whatever, nine times, how much is that? It's a lot of money. Yeah. But you make a couple of real nice pepper mills and sell them for $200, and there you go. All right, that's all the sanding I was going to do. So that... And then uh, I would, uh, if you want to put sanding sealer on it, I do it on the lathe. Um, and then if I'm going to finish it, I, I finish them off the lathe. And you can do it on the lathe. You know, it depends on the type of finish that you're going to use. Um, and there, see my little bottle cap? That's what, I was trying to, that's what I was trying to accomplish there. And it comes down. At the, it went over a little bit right there, but it comes down and it stops at the bottom of the uh, spigot. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is the perfect pepper mill in an hour and a half. <laughs>
Um, for a finish, I use uh, Danish oil. I'll do a coat or two of Danish oil, and then I'll put on uh, white bond poly on top of that, which is really durable. I would not use, I've heard, don't use lacquer because that can get gummy and it's not very waterproof. Uh, I would not use a, a wax only or shellac. They're not very durable. Uh, no walnut oil. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Question is, do I finish the interior? Yes, I put a coat of shellac on the inside. Uh, not, uh, I use the uh, amber shellac. Um, the reason, and that's, that's a good argument. I mean, some people say you never finish the inside. Well, the reason I do that is two things. Uh, one, it seals the wood. Not that I need to seal it, but it seals the wood. But second thing is, it looks like I've done something on the inside. Again, that customer takes the lid off to, to fill this up. I don't want them to see raw wood. I want to take as much care and just show them that I've done something on the inside. The amber shellac leaves a little bit of a tint. If you use super blonde, it looks like you haven't done anything at all. Um, don't use any kind of an oil. Don't use Danish oil. Don't use anything like that. It, the smell will never go away. Shellac is food safe. It's odorless. They, they use shellac to coat pills with for you to swallow. So that is the only finish I would use. Shellac or, or leave it raw. It wouldn't do anything else. Thank you. Any other questions? I thank you for your time. Appreciate okay. it. So that